<laughs> but Marco will give a special seminar after the school at 2 p.m. You're all invited to come. I'm sure it's going to be great. And so Marco will do his last lecture. And well, OK, Marco. Thanks. Um, so so did, did, did I get like the abstract and the title for the They talk? did. You did get the message with the, uh, ah, I think they didn't send. Okay. Well. You got a message about the sending, right? Yeah, yeah, but I don't know. I asked Humberto to send it. So, so, but anyhow, let me just say that it will be basically Sorry. like a combination of everything that I was talking about and everything that the team was talking about. It will be like putting together this theoretical calculation and applying them to some real data with all the subtleties that he was discussing, with the likelihoods, um, priors, posteriors, different choices, volume factors, all the other things. OK, so um, any, anyhow, so, so today um, uh, I wanted to talk about very many different things, but unfortunately there will be no time, as always. So. We have to like, uh, try to condense it a bit. So the, the roughly the plan, I mean, so far we only discussed dark matter. And I, I, I went into some details explaining how can we model the nonlinear dark matter field and get some, some uh, calculation which is under control and make some predictions which are reliable and um, which, which match the reality. And, uh, there, were, there were a couple of key ingredients in doing that. One was that, first of all, we had to find out what were the correct um, equations of motion for the long-level fluctuations. These are not naive ideal fluid equations because dark matter, even on large scales, doesn't behave like an ideal fluid. There are always small corrections coming from sh small scales and their nonlinearities, which effectively behave like some kind of a speed of sound in the equation of motion or viscosity or these kind of terms. So they're sourcing the long wave fluctuations. We saw that these counter terms in the effective theory are uh, really needed. And we saw it from very different, many different points of view. Like just they come out from the full Boltzmann equation. If you do the smoothing and averaging over the short scales, then they also are there by some symmetry arguments if you just use um, mass or momentum conservation is an argument. And they're also there if you just do the explicit loop calculations. You can see that your loops have some sensitivity to the high K modes where you don't trust your theory. You don't know how, what to do with it unless you add the corresponding counter term, which happens to be the, the, have the same long wavelength behavior, the same K dependence on large scales. And in their amplitude, they absorb whatever mistake you make when you do the loop and, for example, integrate to infinity. And we saw that, that, that uh, perturbatively, like order by order, adding more uh, density fluctuations in your formulas or adding more spatial derivatives, these were two expansion parameters, um, we can improve uh, the modeling of uh, dark matter density field. Um, and the, uh, yesterday, we spent the whole day discussing about one particular um, feature of perturbation theory, which is very interesting. And this is that in our universe, which has several different scales, and this is that there is another parameter which has to do with the typical displacements of the particles. It was not obvious maybe from the equations, but it was there. And uh, these were these like I infrared contributions um, that, that we discussed yesterday. And we saw that in general, uh, as long as you have a equivalence principle, which is almost always the case unless you, you, you discuss some situation where you have fifth forces or modify gravity, then um, all these infrared contributions cancel always in all observables um, if there are no features in the power spectrum. However, we do have a feature, and this is what makes the universe interesting. There is a BO feature, and then there is some observable effect of these infrared modes. They're causing the damping of the wiggles in the power spectrum, or effectively, when you go to, Fourier, for, to real space, the broadening of the peak. These were two uh, important ingredients. And so now we have a complete story for the dark matter. And many, many of you ask this question, how about galaxies? We are not observing dark matter. And so why do we care about making very precise predictions about dark matter, when in the real universe we are seeing galaxies, and we are not even seeing them in some real position space, but actually there are these retrospace distortions. So these are two things that I want to talk about today. How do we deal with these two things in perturbation theory? 
Uh, I also promised that I'm going to talk a bit about more advanced things, and unfortunately, this is not going to happen very much. I will, I will mention a few of those things that I want to talk about uh, in this lecture, but you will not get a complete overview. Maybe it's for the best. I don't know. Um, OK, so um, now one thing that, that, that I, I can say is that the logic now is going to be exactly the same as for the dark matter. So in the dark matter case, we do have some equations of motion. We know that, for instance, the computer solves, when you do the dark matter simulation, some equation. Okay? It can be written like a Boltzmann equation, uh, like collisionless Boltzmann equation, or Vlasov equation is another way that it's known for. Um, um, and, and, and just solve these equations, okay? Or we can turn them into some kind of a fluid equation, some approximation of the long wavelength fields. And so we do have some equations of motion. We know what is the thing that we're trying to solve. When it comes to galaxies, or even dark matter halos, we don't have equations of motion anymore, okay? So we don't know, for instance, which equation to put on the computer to give us galaxy formation. We can only put some prescriptions, like if there is that much mass and that much gas, and this is the temperature from that many stars, and then like explode this fraction in that amount of time, and transfer that much heat, and form a black hole, and do the AGN. So there are, there are like only prescriptions, and this is what we have to live with. Um, but this means that also, when we try to write down the, the theoretical expressions, we cannot start now from the equations of motion. We don't know which equations of motions to, to, to write down. However, still, we, we are not completely um, lost because we do have some guidance, um, which is basically comes from, from the symmetries again. So in the same way as you could discover that there are some extra terms in the equations of motion for dark matter, because from symmetry arguments, you, you, you know that there must be there. There must be some source to the long-term fluctuations from the short scales. In the same way, we can do the same thing for, 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 for galaxy um, formation. And there are a few assumptions here, OK? So first of all, you always have to assume something. I mean, symmetries cannot tell you much in, in the most general setup. But what we usually assume about galaxy formation is that it is a local process. So whatever happens when the things collapse and form galaxies, it is happening locally in space. So there is still notion of separation of scales, OK? So galaxy formation is something that has to do with the local complications where galaxies form. But it, does not, it doesn't matter what is happening across the universe for how this galaxy is going to form. So there's some sort of locality in space, OK? That is very important. The moment you have locality in space, you can then separate the discussion of the, of the long wavelength fields from the short wavelength complications, OK? So no matter what is happening here, and no matter what is happening here, and no matter what is happening here, the long wavelength fields are again going to be uh, described in terms of density fluctuations and plus some corrections from these small scales, which are given by the symmetry arguments with some free coefficients. Okay? That will be our guiding principle. The second thing is that, that, that we usually assume is that the dominant force which, which determines how the galaxies and halos are going to form is gravity. Okay? So of course, in the details, when we talk about real like, like formation of galaxies, baryonic physics is crucial. And there, of course, there is a lot of, um, a, a lot of details will decide whether your galaxy is going to be large or small or blue or red or active or inactive and so on. But uh, if, if, if you just talk about long wave fluctuations again, the, the gravitational force is the only thing that matters, OK? So with these two things in mind, let us start and, and, and try to write down our guess for what the density field um, of galaxies looks like given some underlying density field of matter fluctuations, OK? This is known as the bias expansion, and you have seen it many times. And I'm just going to write down some very general formula, and we're going to discuss a bit uh, how does it simplify in the case that we are interested in for the one loop power spectrum, for instance. And also, we are going to see, um, well, yes, what is, the, what is the meaning of these bias coefficients, how to think about them in this perturbation theory, from the perturbation theory point of view. and um, uh, yes, a few other few other things, okay, and maybe show some examples at the end. So um, now, one one thing that is peculiar about 
uh, hell or Gauss information is that even though the process is local in space in some sense, so there is a small region of space which influences how the things are going to form, um, it is not local in time. I already mentioned this, and uh, the reason was that uh, all density fluctuations on small or large scales evolve almost with the same time scale. So the Hubble scale is a typical time scale over which fluctuations evolve. And to form some object usually takes one Hubble time on average, okay? So therefore, um, if, if you think that here you put like some, scale, some time scale and let's say that this is like proportional to h to the minus one, it's some formation time, time scale, and you have some galaxies, for instance, some galaxies, some group of galaxies sitting here in some region of space, then the way that these galaxies looked in the past, so now this is time, right? And this is space. Yeah. So, so if we go back in the past, all this region came from some region in the initial conditions. Okay. And along, along this history, I had many particles here that were coming together, forming ma many small halos maybe, that were merging, becoming bigger galaxies, and eventually I get these two, for instance. So this is, so there is some mean trajectory of this region. It starts in the initial conditions. There is some kind of evolution. Things are happening, and you get the formation of objects, okay? And all this is happening in the presence of some long wavelength density fluctuation, which is there in the initial conditions, but also it evolves. It's getting maybe bigger and even bigger, okay? Because also the fluctuations grow in time, the longer fluctuations, okay? But because the time scale for this process here, for things, for things to form, is the same time scale on which the long wave fluctuations evolve, and there is a back reaction of the short scales and the long scales and so on and so forth, then you cannot say that, oh, like I'm just going to, to, to imagine that, this, uh, that these short scales have always local in time, um, basically response to the long modes. But actually, there is some kind of a memory. You have to basically know how the entire information history went on. Okay? And so, the, so then, if, if you ask yourself, what, what, what decides what is the number density of halos here? Well, it is decided by the details of the small scale physics, it, and, but it's also decided by the environment where these things are happening. So what is happening with the long wavelength modes in this region of space. And so last week, I think that you saw, I, I, I don't know if you really talked about it, you saw, for example, like the simple models, for example, for bias. You saw that this intuitive picture that, for instance, if you have a large overdensity in some region of space, sorry, long wavelength overdensity, then you, you can form halos a bit easier because you, you can cross the threshold for the halo formation a bit easier, and you're going to have more halos, but if you have the same long wavelength fluctuations, which now look like under density in some other region of space, there you're going to have a little bit, it will be a bit harder to cross the threshold and we have less galaxies and so on and so forth. So, so, so this number density of, of objects in some region of space um, depends on the long wavelength fluctuations and it depends on all possible effects that long wavelength fluctuations can have. So for instance, delta long is just the leading order effect. You may have delta long squared, or you may have tidal fields of the long modes affecting how galaxies form. If you have a big tidal field, it will be one thing. If you have a small tidal field, it will be another thing. So all these effects matter, and they matter in a complicated, non-local in time way. So the most general formula, in fact, that, that we can write down for how many halos do we expect in a, in, a, in a given position x here, it's some final time tau. This is going to be some, um, complicated sum over all contributions, which have to do with the long wavelength fluctuations and their observable effects, like delta, delta squared, tidal field squared, and so on. So whatever you can write down of, of this sort. And, and we always have to do some integral um, 
from 0 to tau of d tau prime. Okay, there will be some coefficients, cn tau tau prime, which are measuring uh, responses to these long wavelength like, like uh, observable effects, but they're non local in time, they depend um, both of, of, on, on tau and tau prime. And then you have some operator, on of x along the fluid element of this region of space, tau prime. So x uh, along the, f the, the, the fluid, uh, p the position of the fluid element is basically any x fluid of tau prime here, okay? So you just have some formal expression which tells you, oh, you have to take into account two things. First, that the long wave fluctuations can affect formation of galaxies um, in many different ways through many different observable effects. And second, be careful about this locality in time. And so what are these kind of things here, okay? Well, what you can do is to write down all possible observable effects which are long wave modes produce. And these are gravitational effects. Let's focus on that. And for instance, you may have things like um, anything that has to do with second derivatives of the gravitational potential because this is what is producing real observable effects. So you may, for example, the simplest thing, first order in perturbation theory is di dj phi. But look, this is a tensor, and these are a scalar quantities. So the only way to make it into scalar quantities is to multiply by delta ij, in which the case this becomes this is chronic delta. This becomes a delta field, okay? It's just Laplacian of phi, which is proportional to delta, okay? So this is one option. You can put delta of x and tau, tau prime. Or for instance, you may have uh, delta square. And then a second order in perturbation theory you can even do the contraction of this tensor with itself. So for example, you, you, you can write down something like this, d i d j phi times another d i d j phi. So you see, this one and this one are, are, are the same order in perturbation theory, and they have the same number of derivatives. So they're both equally important in some sense. Okay, and so on and so forth. So you can, so, so all, all, all these things like tides, tide square, delta square, and all higher order contributions, they all contribute to that, how your galaxies form. In the same way, with, along the same lines of the intuitive picture that you had with a simple delta, just boosting or, or suppressing the formation of objects, also the other things will do the same, okay? Of course, their importance is smaller because there are higher orders in perturbation theory, but nevertheless, uh, they're important. In, in principle, we have to keep them. Now, this, uh, like, uh, um, this is a bit complicated formal general uh, equation, and you can read more about it uh, and, and how to really uh, think about it and simplify it further in some of these papers. Like, for instance, this is um, a very nice review of, uh, about the bias tracers um, in large-scale structure. It's a very long review, but very pedagogical. And this is, the, for example, the original paper by Leonardo Senatore where he explains these issues with non-locality in time and deals with it and explains how to come back to some more familiar um, um, uh, expressions. And these more familiar expressions uh, come from the, from the fact that um, this non-locality in time and, and, and this evolution along this, um, like, um, uh, like, like fluid uh, trajectory um, can be expressed, like can be expanded perturbatively. You can treat this evolution in a perturbative way, and then you can rewrite this expression in the, in, into some formula which, which is local in time, okay? This cannot be done in general, so this is very important. So in general, no locality in time is really introducing extra complications, but um, so up to third order in perturbation theory, we can reshuffle things in a way that this complication of the null locality can be rephrased into some other coefficients and modification of the terms and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, uh, when you take into account this evolution um, you, and, and time derivatives and so on and so forth, you're going to end up with something which is local local in time and 
local in, of course, di dj phi, okay? It's a simple function of di dj phi. And so for practical purposes for this course and for most of the things that you're going to need ever, you can write down uh, delta hello at x and t. You can write it down as, as some effective coefficient which comes out from this procedure of doing everything, including this time evolution. B1, which is some function of time, times delta. You can, for example, write down uh, another term, which is like B2 delta squared. I, I'm neglecting this time and space derivatives, but of course, every bias parameter can depend on time, and this field depends on space and time. And for example, then you can do like BG2 times G2. And you can do, let me write it schematically, like B3 and then operator 3, which means that there are a few third order operators you can write down. So what are these third order operators? So for instance, you can have delta cube, you can have delta G2, you can have something which is called G3, gamma 3. This is one of the bases that you can, you can use. And all these functions are some functions of di dj phi. So for instance, this one here, as I said, is like just Laplacian. It's just a contraction of, of a Kronecker delta and di dj phi. This one is delta squared. This one here is, um, well, it's di dj phi squared minus delta squared. So this is what is G2. And these other expressions, like, like this G3, for instance, is some more complicated formula, but it, it depends di dj phi, dj dl phi, dl di phi. So it's a basically multiplication of three tidal tensors and some other things inside as well, but it's proportional to that. There is this other operator, which is also some other linear combination of the tidal fields and so on. Yes? Oh, only on time, only on time. On scale. So, so bias is, so I think that it, now it's a, it's a bit of a matter of, of, of definition, but I think that biases never should depend on scale. Now, the, the way that they become scale dependent effectively is the following. So, so far, I wrote only terms which are per perturbation theory, basically, in delta or di dj phi, okay? So linear, quadratic, and then there are some cubic operators and so on. I can keep going on forever, building more and more building blocks out of this gravitational potential. Of course, at higher orders, I have to worry about this non-localizing time. But let's say up to third order, I, that I can forget about and things will be fine. So, so things are written in terms of these basis operators. For instance, or you can choose any other basis you want. This is like, people sometimes use S square instead of this G2, which just differs here by one third or something like this. So it's a, just a choice of redefinition. But however, you should remember always that we don't have only expansion in deltas or, or fluctuations. We also have derivative expansion. So in the same way as we had some higher derivative terms in the equations of motion for dark matter, we can have higher derivative operators in the bias expansion. So for instance, I can write something which is like B Laplacian times Laplacian delta. No, nobody stops me from introducing another bias coefficient here which tells me that my density field of halos does not depend only on, 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 on the tidal uh, field or delta, but also on derivatives of delta, okay? And so on. I can put many higher derivative terms. Now, of course, this object is dimensionful. So because I'm having a derivative here, there must be some scale in this, in this thing here. And of course, the, the typical scale that enters in the derivative expansion for, for halos, and this is now one important point, is that we had k nonlinear for dark matter. But now we have another scale. 
I don't know how to call it, Kelly M for the mass of the, of the halo for halos. So for instance, if you have very large, very massive objects, their size is, is very large, okay? Particularly the size of the Lagrangian coordinates. And so therefore, um, the whole, when the whole mass collapses to form a halo, you have some kind of, kind of derivative corrections uh, which have a scale which corresponds to the Lagrangian size of the object, okay? So that is a natural scale for, uh, for example, for very massive objects, and therefore here, you will have something which is Lagrangian size of the object, which can be like even 10 megaparsecs, okay, for very massive objects. And so this scale is not necessarily the same as K nonlinear for the dark matter, but it is not something which is super different. It is roughly of the same order of magnitude. For example, very small halos will have much smaller scale and so on. So there is some scale here, and you can then estimate, the point of this discussion is that you can estimate, for example, how big is this contribution compared to these higher order contributions. And, and um, for instance, it turns out that at one loop level, similarly to what happened with the speed of sound, this thing is kind of comparable to the loop corrections which come from the third order things. Because this is the same as the speed of sound for dark matter, basically. You see, it has the same structure, it's the same derivative operator. Now, what happens in practice is that if I combine this expression and this expression, I can write it, if I go to Fourier space, for instance, there will be B1 delta of K, and here there will be B K squared times K squared delta. And so when I combine the two, I can write it as, a, as a, some one plus K squared multiplying delta. So it seems that the B1 has some scale dependence. But I think that the proper way to think about this is that all these biases are time dependent only, and all the scale dependence can come either from the k dependence of different loop corrections, which is calculable, or k dependence of higher derivative terms, which is also calculable. Okay, so so um, so very good. So we, we we do have this expansion, and I don't I don't think that I, I have much more to say about it. So there there are again two expansion parameters. One is delta, the other one is derivative expansion. Now we only have to be a bit more careful because there is another scale in the problem, which is the Lagrangian size of the, of the halo, roughly speaking, which tells you that if you have a very massive uh, object, for example, you, the scale which multiplies these derivatives might be larger number numerically, and if you have a smaller uh, halos, you have a bit smaller number. But anyhow, these scales are not super far away from the nonlinear scale. They're not uh, very different in practice. And so once, once you write this down, then you can go on and do your calculation, okay? So the logic here is, is, is basically getting the solution by just requiring some basic things, like locality in space, um, some symmetry arguments, what this basis pattern can depend on, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is halo bias. This is halo bias, but galaxy bias works in exactly the same way. There is absolutely no reason. Everything I said here would be the same for galaxies. There is, there, is, there is no much difference. Of course, you have to be a bit maybe careful because you want to include baryons as another fluid and allow that there are two different potentials which depend on the fluid, like, like, like for baryons, for dark matter, combine all together. So the expressions can become very complicated, but in practice, at the end of the day, this kind of bus expansion is enough for the precision that we care about, okay? And the coefficients will be different, of course. So if you have, for instance, galaxy of certain type, it will have one set of bias parameters. A galaxy of another type will have different set of bias parameters. And those cannot be predicted from any perturbation theory. So maybe you can build some model of, of, of galaxy formation which can tell you, roughly speaking, what are these biases. But that's a different story, OK? Now, for, for, for the halo bias, I think that there is some way to, to, to because halo bias is, is really about dark matter. And so, for instance, if you go to the initial conditions and you look at the density peaks and you estimate, for instance, how how, how big halos in each position are going to collapse by the time of fraction zero and see how many of them there are and study their properties from the initial conditions, you can get all these bias parameters. However, it's very important to say that these bias parameters are again, derived from some model, 
some spherical collapse or ellipsoidal collapse or like one thing or the, or the other. And if you go into the simulations and measure them carefully, they may not necessarily be the same. So it's again a matter of precision, like how, so, so you know, I, I would say that for, for dark matter halos, we can get some priors on what these numbers are supposed to be. So for example, if B1 is equal to two, it cannot be that B2 is going to be equal to five. That is not going to happen. So if you get this thing in your measurement, something is wrong. But we cannot have the exact values. Um, that is always um, left to be determined from observations. Um, OK, so, so this is the bias expansion. This is valid for galaxies. This is valid for halos. There is not much more to say about it in, in reality. So all that I'm saying is that on large scales, if you look at the long wave fluctuations, the details do not matter. And all that matters is like, um, what are the gravitational forces doing, and the gravitational forces depend on the tidal fields of the gravitational potential. And so therefore, you have to uh, say that your uh, delta hell is some general expansion which depends on all these things, okay? There is a subtlety of the, um, of the non locality in time, but up to, third, like up to fourth order in perturbation theory, everything is okay. And this is enough, for example, for the one loop power spectrum. So that's all very good. Now, let me, let me do a few examples, just to point out a couple of things, um, which, which are very, like, um, uh, which, which are good things to remember, because they're, they're kind of important. So first of all, let us calculate uh, p halo halo in the linear theory. So what is, what is the halo halo power spectrum in the linear theory? Well, I have to go to this expression, take one delta halo, multiply it with another delta halo, take expectation value. So in the linear theory, I don't have to worry about any of these higher order corrections. This is just enough, okay? So it will become simply equal to B1 squared times P, P linear of K, okay? And now, uh, this, what, what, what does this mean? This means that if I, if, I, if I take a look on very large scales, and I look, for example, this is my linear power spectrum, then the, then the, the, the halo, or the galaxy power spectrum, is just going to be something which follows this line, by, but, but, but with some multiplicative factor, which is B1 squared, okay? And this is a bit annoying, because sometimes from large scale structure, we are interested in measuring, for instance, the amplitude of the matter power spectrum. This is one very important observable. We can measure, for example, the amplitude of fluctuations in the CMB, but that is at very early times. And then, depending on, on, the, on the expansion history and like what is happening in the later universe, these fluctuations grow. And the growth factor depends on like various different things. And we would like to measure independently what is the amplitude of the fluctuations in the late universe. So, Usually, this is parameterized by sigma eight, okay? So the amplitude of the power spectrum is parameterized by sigma eight. And here, the power spectrum um, goes like sigma eight squared. So overall, this combination goes like B1 squared, sigma eight squared. And so you see there's a very strong degeneracy between B1 and sigma eight. You can always trade B1 for some compensation in the amplitude, okay? And if you try to run your MCMC and try to put both of these parameters inside, it will just give you like a very degenerate contour, and you will have no clue what is B1 or what is sigma eight. So you can only measure very precisely their combination. So if you look at this contour, for instance, it will look like something like this. I never understand if it is like that or like that, but anyhow, one way or another. And so the, so, so, so the fact that it's very thin means that you can very well constrain B1 times sigma eight as a single parameter but you cannot tell how big is uh, sigma eight or how big is B1, okay? So that is one very annoying thing about this bias. You see, if you're interested in some cosmological parameters, these bias parameters are very annoying thing. They're like, um, they're there and you don't know what to do with them, okay? So this is, this is bad, this is a bad, it's a nuisance parameter, yes. Well, not for, for not for people who do galaxy formation. So this is a very, very important caveat. Now, there is a way, there is a very nice way within uh, the, 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 the 
the biases parmesan formulas to break this degeneracy, okay? And I just want to remind you what it is, maybe some of you know, and the way to break this degeneracy is to also calculate the bias spectrum. So if you calculate a three-level bias spectrum, so what you have to do, you have to take three different fields, go to Fourier space, it's very simple, you just do expectation value delta, 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 and you remember, when we were doing it for the dark matter, there was this F2 at second order. So the result was proportional to F2. Now there is no F2, but we have other, well, actually, there is also F2. I mean, of course, the nonlinear uh, field. But there is like, um, there, are, there are other also, also second order contributions, like this one or this one. And you have to take all of them into account, OK? So when you do this, So you're going to get like one contribution which has uh, three deltas, and one of them is calculated as second order perturbation theory. So there will be something proportional, let me do just proportionality, to B1 cube times, uh, well, schematically PP, okay? So it is the same as, as, as what I wrote yesterday with F2 and so on, but it has B1 cube. And then you're going to have other contributions, like for, for example, when you have uh, B1, B1 times B2, and there will be B1, B1, BG2, and so on. There will be other guys which contain B2 and BG2. Let's forget about those for the moment. But if I look at this thing here, it, it scales like B1 cubed times sigma 8 to the fourth power. So you see, I can write this as B1 sigma 8 cubed times sigma 8. And why is this happening? It is happening because I have four fields here. So I have four sigma 8s. But I only started with three halo fields, and I have only three B1s. But then, to get B1 to the cube, Yes. No, 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 this, sorry, this, this is the nonlinear delta. Ah, okay. Of course, I mean, look. Um, it's a bias yes, it's a bias expansion, but it's in the nonlinear field. I mean, of course, I can expand each of these things in the linear second order, third order, and so on. But, of course, the, the how, how galaxies form depend on the full nonlinear density field. And, of course, there is a perturbative expansion of this nonlinear density field. And so when I do this perturbative expansion, this is what I get. So, so now you see, if you go to your galaxy survey, for instance, and you measure the power spectrum, you measure this combination very well. And if you measure the bias spectrum, and you use this measurement of combination for the power spectrum, you can get sigma 8. So this is how we break these degeneracies. In this plot, there will be some other degeneracy contour. And then you can, coming from the bias spectrum, they will intersect and tell you, OK, this is, this is my, so for example, this is B, this is P. And then you're going to get very nice measurements. So this is one way to, to break these degeneracies. And so the reason why I'm saying this is that even though it is true that all these nuisance parameters look degenerate with everything, the fact that we know exactly how they enter in, in, into many different correlation functions, and also we can calculate because of this particular uh, like derivative structure of these operators, which turn into some particular momentum dependence in the k-space, we can calculate the shapes. We can still get a lot of cosmology out. Because cosmological parameters are not in completely degenerate with these things. So there is still some way out. Yeah. Also, with lazy, you can use the break. Oh, <laughs> right. Yes, I completely agree. So, so, so another way to break degeneracy is to build another observables, which are not just involving halos, but to do things like halo matter. So if you can estimate what is the matter um, power density field from, for example, weak lensing, then you can cross-correlate your weak lensing um, delta matter with delta halo. And now you're going to have delta halo delta matter, which will be proportional to B1 times sigma 8. And, and then you, you break the degeneracy again in the same way. So this is absolutely, yes, it's absolutely correct. It's another way to do it. Yeah. Yes, this is the third way to do it, in fact. And I'm going to talk about that later. Yeah. So that's, there's a third way using Redshift distortions to break this degeneracy. This is why I'm mentioning this, because 
So you see, if you do only galaxies, you have to go to the bispectrum. If you, allow, if you, if you do have weak line scene, you can do it with the, with the cross spectra, matter, hell matter. Um, and uh, also, if you have only galaxies, but in redshift space, then somehow you can get it out even without uh, going to the bispectrum or using anything else. So we have, we have ways around these issues. But anyhow, I just wanted to mention this. Now, um, let me say a few words also about this expansion, because what I wrote here are some operators that you have to write down, like what kind of contributions possibly can appear in this formula. But there are extra terms, and let me explain now what they are. So uh, I, I told you that, that, for instance, we do not have equations of motion here to, 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 to start with and derive some formula like we did for perturbation theory for this thing. We can just write down the general expansion. But um, unfortunately, we don't have even the mass and momentum conservation for galaxy formation. Okay? And let me explain why do I say that. So, so for instance, uh, what are galaxies for us? I mean, you, you go on the sky and you measure dots. You say, like, there's one dot here, one dot there, one dot there, and you make a catalog, okay? So we don't know what is the mass of the, of the dark matter halo around this galaxy or whatever other property you want. So we can maybe guess it, but we don't really know, okay? And so the situation where you have two galaxies, you count as two dots. But if there is another situation where you have a similar mass of the, of the halo, but they merge, you count it as a single dot. So, so basically, you lose information about that how much mass you have, okay? And then, and then our arguments of mass and momentum conservation do not apply, okay? So in other words, if I have two different realizations, you remember, I was doing this sphere, I would change a bit the short modes, I will, I will ask how does it affect the long fluctuations, and we saw that it starts with like K square and so on. But the crucial is for that to happen, we had to have conservation of mass and conservation of momentum. But galaxies, for us, are just counting points, and since they merge, they can disappear. You can start with three points, they merge, and you get one point. So we don't know, we don't conserve mass anymore, okay? So therefore, when we combine, so remember, in the, in the case of perturbation theory, if you have some F2 kernel, and you combine some very, uh, like, uh, short wavelength fluctuations, we can generate a long wavelength fluctuation, which goes like k square times delta long. Or, or let me just put it stochastic part. It's just like k square, okay? It was not possible to generate something which, so this is k, okay? It was not possible to generate something which is constant because there was a mass of momentum conservation. However, if I have galaxies, so there is, so for galaxies, there is no mass of momentum conservation. So there will be, again, some contribution from the short scales. But now, because there is no mass of momentum conservation, it will scale a constant. So if you look at the density field of galaxies, there are long wavelength modes which, which basically uh, have a power spectrum which is constant. And this is what is called shot noise. So you see, I have to add to this bias expansion. Let me, this is a mess, this blackboard. So let me try to organize it a bit. OK, so this is the definition of G2. Let us forget about these other things, because they're not that important for us. So we have second order fields. We have third order fields. We have higher derivative operators. And we also have something that, which I'm going to call epsilon, which is noise. And the power spectrum of epsilon, basically, if you do the expectation value of epsilon, epsilon, is going to be constant. And this is what is called shot noise. OK? So just one second. And this comes from the fact that now, you do have allowed some long run fluctuations because you don't conserve mass and momentum to have something which goes like a constant. Before, these purely stochastic terms were going like k to the 4 for dark matter. So for the dark matter case, it's k to the 4. No way to produce any significant fluctuations on large scales. But now, if you don't conserve mass and momentum, you can do it. And there is a discontribution. Okay. Yes? Uh, I'm just confused about the uh, mass conservation that you're talking about. Yes. 
oh, the, fundamentally the mass is conserved, of course, but the problem is that we don't know. We're we only counting number density. So we are basically, when we do this density field, we are just saying, like, okay, there are that many galaxies here. So, so if we knew, in other words, if somebody could tell you, like, oh, given this galaxy, th there is that much mass around it, for example, imagine there is a perfect relation between the luminosity of a galaxy and the mass of the env environmental, of the halo and so on. Then you could do the weighting of each point with the mass, and then you would have mass conservation in your formulas, and, and this constant thing will just disappear. And in fact, there is a te technique which is, which, is, which is a reduction of the shot noise on large scales, which is basically mass weighting. So if you have some estimate of the mass of the, of the, of the um, for example, dark matter halo, given some properties of the galaxy, you can do some, uh, you, you can basically do the mass weighting of your galaxy catalog. And if your estimate for the mass is good, you're going to reduce dramatically the size of this shot noise on large scales. Right? And in the limit of a perfect mass weighting, when you know exactly how much mass there is, you basically go back to the scaling, which is k, k to the four in the power spectrum. But because we don't know how much mass there is, and we are still estimating the density field based on counting objects, and we are comparing that to the underlying dark matter, then uh, unfortunately we have these things, okay? So, so let me just say another comment, and I'm done with the, with the bias tracers, is, is again, so, so this kind of thing is something that we add in the same way as we were adding, for example, stochastic term to the equations of motion, in the dark matter case, we are now adding some sto stochastic term to the bias expansion. It's only that they have different power spectra, okay? This one is constant, and the, the other one was k to the four. But even if, if you didn't know all this story about the symmetries, mass motor conservation, you can, again, discover that you need stochastic terms in the same way as you can discover that you need stochastic terms in the perturbation theory. So remember, when we do two-two diagram, there was a UV contribution which looks like k to the four. And therefore, there must be something in the equations of motion or in this like, solution to absorb this UV, UV dependence. And the same thing is true for, for, for the bias tracers, okay? And so the, the part which looks like that, which has a UV contribution which is constant, is the power spectrum of delta square. Now let me show you that. So for instance, if you, if you calculate uh, what is the power spectrum of delta square K1? So this is the squared field and then Fourier mode K1. And another square field and the Fourier mode K2. I'm not going to do the full blah, 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 K, D3, K, blah, blah, blah. You just go to the Fourier space. Here there are no kernels. You just have to multiply four fields. It's very simple. You do all possible contractions. And what comes out is something like this. Two times integral d3 k over, well, sorry, d3, let's call it p, over 2 pi q. There will be power spectrum of p, power spectrum of k minus p, and then there is an overall 2 pi cube, Dirac delta, let's call this k1, Dirac delta of k1 plus k2. So of course, this is just an overall factor, which comes always when you calculate correlation functions. But then this expression here is what is the, what is the, 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 the K, K1 dependent uh, contribution to the one loop, in this case, um, halo power spectrum from this particular operator. And now look what happens when K1 goes to zero. So when you go on very large scales, what happens with this formula? When I send k1 to zero, this becomes p of p. So I basically have some number. So this goes like p delta square delta square goes to a constant. And again, this constant picks up a lot of contribution from the UV modes. If you really evaluate this integral, a lot of it comes from the very high case. And you don't know how to make sense out of this unless you allow for another term, the stochastic term in this bias expansion which will absorb this UV dependence. So the finite difference 
is going, going to be what you measure, and this is what we call shot noise. Okay. Yes, this is uh, maybe maybe from this point of view. I mean, there is a there is a more like standard point of view that you, how people introduce shot noise. They just tell you like, oh look, imagine you have a like, finite number, finite density of objects, and then if you just write down like the density field of this thing, be a bunch of delta functions. If you calculate the power spectrum, you will see that there is a connected piece which is the power spectrum of the underlying uh, density field that you use to generate these modes plus some something which goes like one over m bar. Okay. Now here, there, it's not entirely clear how do, does this happen, but maybe some intuition can be the following: that for each object, if you if you imagine that you have a bunch of objects, this argument of of mass momentum conservation basically has to do with spheres that you can draw around each one of them, such that you populate the whole space. And if you say that whatever is happening in some region of space collapses into one point, then uh, you may somehow think that, roughly speaking, um, the, the size of the region has to do with 1 over n bar. And then uh, the amplitude of this stochastic noise will be related to 1 over n bar. So that, that's an important point. Let me say that this thing is, is, is roughly equal to 1 over n bar where n bar is the number density of objects. Okay? But it is not equal to 1 over n bar. So if somebody comes and tells you, look, the shot noise is 1 over n bar, absolutely not. It can be like 2 times of 1 over n bar, or 1.5. I mean, there is absolutely no reason to have a particular number. And in practice, it can be anything, but it, it better be of this order of mine. If it is 100 times bigger, there is something terribly wrong. Okay? Or if it is 10 times smaller, terribly wrong. Okay? It's something of this order of mine. Okay, so um, so you see, everything is the same as for the dark matter. Okay, you have some perturbative expansion for the dark matter. All these coefficients were fixed because we knew what are the equations of motion, so we had some counter terms like higher derivative operator, stochastic term, and so on. The rest was fixed. Now here, we don't know the equations of motion; things are more complicated, so nothing is fixed. But the structure is always the same. You have expansion parameter, which is delta, derivative expansion. Now there are two different scales, but not such a big deal. You, can, you have to add higher derivative operators. You have to add stochastic contributions. And everything works out nicely. If you keep track of all possible terms which are allowed by symmetries, you're going to always be able to renormalize this bias expansion, meaning that you can always, whenever in whatever loop, at any order in perturbation theory, whenever you have sensitivities to the short scales, they can be always put into some of these parameters, and the thing will always work out nicely. Okay? So for instance, one thing that you can try, if you want, as an exercise, is to calculate the contribution which comes from the B3 times delta cube. Okay? So imagine that you're doing that. If you take B3 delta cube and correlate with the linear field here to get the one loop contribution, you're multiplying delta cube times delta linear. There are no kernels. There is nothing. So basically, we only p linear times some simple integral, just a number. So, so, so in other words, b3 will just, again, renormalize b1. This is the more technical term. So at one loop, it just contributes to something which is degenerate with b1. So the, the whole thing, the whole expression together, when you combine all these different contributions from higher order terms, is what is called renormalized bias b1 or then will be renormalized B2, renormalized BJ2, renormalized noise, and so on and so forth. And you are guaranteed that in any endpoint function, the same bias parameters will appear, so which is very important. OK, so there are many other things that I could tell you about bias. Uh, and I'm completely running out of time. So let me show a few slides uh, very, very briefly. So um, yes. Oh, no. Yes. 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 Yes, you have to go to nonlinear. Now, how to do that? I mean, 
the reason why I didn't talk, I didn't say anything about weak lensing is because perturbation theory is not very well, uh, I think, at least in this, in this form, it is not obviously clear how to apply to the weak lensing. And the reason for that is that when you calculate the lensing predictions, there are kernels which pick up contributions from high k's. So these formulas make sense only up to some k. So there's a sharp cut in k where you can trust them. But how, how do you know what, how to supplement it at, at, at higher k's? And so that is the problem that, that um, is not easy to solve. And so for instance, if you add these extra nonlinearities to the biases function, they can produce very complicated kind of terms in the weak lensing, very large because they have a peak in the, they peak in the high k limit and all these, all these counter terms and these derivative expansion parameters. They're going to contribute a lot from the UV. And you're not sure, like, should you trust any of these things? It's very complicated because the, the scales are mixed. So short and long scales are mixed in the weak lensing. And the whole methodology of perturbation theory relies on the fact that we can separate scales. And so this is why um, it is not immediately obviously obvious how to apply this. Maybe there is a way, but I, uh, we have to think about it. It's not, it's not straightforward. Yeah, that's, that's a bit. Uh, this is why uh, in the weak lensing you have to rely on something else, like hello model or like uh, something which tells you roughly what is happening on small scales. So perturbation theory is not great. I mean, it cannot tell you what happens on small scales. I mean, it is designed to really reach super high precision on large scales. The design here is like to be a very powerful tool, but as long as you can separate scales. If you cannot separate scales, and if everything is mixed, then uh, this becomes a problem. Okay, so let me let me uh, just skip all this. This I already showed. I wanted to comment on it, but I don't have time. Let me just show you like like, like a figure, just to tell you that, that all this all this seems like some kind of formula, very complicated. I don't know, very abstract, blah blah blah. But at the end of the day, you can really uh, it, it really works. I mean, it's not some uh, Made up, made up thing completely. And so what you see here is an, an exercise we did. We would run, for example, the full end-body simulation, and this is this is one slice of the simulation, okay, for some halos in this mass. It's a high-resolution simulation. And so this is how the universe looks like. You see that, you know, you see you have big clusters, and so there are some filaments, the usual story. Then we take exact same initial conditions, okay. And we apply perturbation theory formulas. Because if perturbation theory is to work, it should give you the correct nonlinear density field. One thing which is crucial here, and this is what I want to mention, is to include these bulk flows properly. Otherwise, your halos are going to be in the wrong position. But that you can do in the exactly same way as I explained yesterday, because the equivalence principle works both for halos and galaxies and dark matter particles. So if you do perturbation theory plus IRS summation, on the initial conditions, and you produce the delta nonlinear as a field, this is what you get using this cubic bias. But what do you use for okay, I'll, 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 I, can, I, can, I can explain that. So basically, we, 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 leave it, we leave them free, and we fit them such that these two maps agree the best. So this is basically like, rather than fitting just the power spectrum, which is some summary statistics, now what we can do is to fit all Fourier modes at the same time because we have the full maps. And there is no cosmic variance here because we are using the same seed, like the same like density fluctuations in the initial conditions for simulations, the same density fluctuations in the initial conditions for perturbation theory, and therefore the realization must be identical. There cannot be a difference if the perturbation theory was perfect, okay? Now, it's not perfect. There's always some residual noise. But the important point here is that once you fit these parameters to the, their best fit values, then you can look at these two maps, and they look very much uh, like one another. I mean, like you have the same kind of structures in the same places, the same filaments, the same halos, and so on. So it's a very so, so 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 you see you can produce the full map without ever doing any anything about short scales or what anything whatsoever. Because on, look, this is 20 megaparsecs. So this is all, on large scales, everything looks good. If you open up this cluster and you want to see what is inside, 
of course, the 10 body simulation is going to be very different from perturbation theory. But as long as you're interested in large, or what's happening on large scales, the two, the two can be uh, matched perfectly. And just as a comparison, this is the map that you get when you take the nonlinear dark matter field from simulation and multiply by B1 and, and fit for the best possible B1. So this is basically like doing B1 times hell of fit, okay? But only on the field level. So now this map doesn't look like these two. So, 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 so modeling the nonlinear density field, so you can see, if you look at the, even by I, you can tell that this is not a good model for the nonlinear density field. Even, even if you use the nonlinear dark matter density field from simulation. And this is what people usually do. So I think that, that um, yes, so uh, I, can, I could explain, I could take the whole two more days to explain all the details of this comparison, why is this the case, and so on. But I just wanted to show, like, uh, um, to have some idea about uh, what is happening. So, 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 so let me just say one more thing. What we are, when, we, when we do this exercise for dark matter, for instance, here, we allow B1 to be a free function of K. So now, this is very, very important, because imagine that I give you the, the, the dark matter power spectrum, the nonlinear power spectrum, and I give you the measurement of the, of, the, of the power spectrum of halos. If I allow free function of k, you can always match the two curves perfectly. Okay? However, if I allow free function of k and I compare fields, it will never work, because it's not that you only have to measure, match the power spectrum. You have to match every single Fourier mode. So all phases and amplitudes have to be correct. And if you adjust your B1 of K to fix one Fourier mode, then the other one will go off and so on. So if you want to match all of them, you have to be, you, you, you cannot do it with a single B1 as a function of K. So you see, this test on the field level is much more stringent than just looking at the summary statistics. So Tim mentioned that most of the time, we are of course interested in summary statistics, but there are some examples where it's much better to look at the field. For example, if you want to test different models, this is much better test. Because like, you cannot hide here. You know, in the power spectrum, it's a smooth function. You can always fit with whatever. Very easy. I mean, anybody can make up a model. I can give you an exercise, come up with a bias model. And all of you will come up with a different model. We'll all fit, very beautiful. But if you look at the field, they're all going to be a disaster. So this is, um, this is a very important point. And in perturbation theory, we have a way to get good fields also. So the field is correct. All endpoint functions are correct at the same time, with the same bias parameters. It's a very important point. When you say field is correct, there's a coarse grain. Um, well, we do it in the, at, at, at the maybe 0.1 megaparsec is some filter of, of the smallest cell in whatever. You have to like, in perturbation theory. Or, no, 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 yes, we, we do it, yes, so, so this comparison is done, allowing that, that all these bus parameters are free functions of K. So um, on large scales, they're constant, as they should be. On small scales, they get some scale, small scale dependence. And let's even forget about small scales. We can, we can of course, when we compare Fourier modes, we can always decide up to which K do we want to go. And I'm showing the real space thing where this is a bit more difficult to see, but even if you go to Fourier space, um, anyhow, this is a very impressive, I, I don't know if you appreciate how impressive it is. <laughs> um, so if you, if you go to Fourier space, and now what is plotted here is like what is the difference between the best fitted map and the truth, okay? So imagine that you have a curve, so you have some data points, you do the best fit curve, and then you plot the residuals, and you calculate the variance of the residuals. That will be your noise, how much noise is the data. So this is what we are doing here. We take the best fitted map, we subtract from the true map, and calculate the power spectrum of this difference, which is the variance of this difference. And look how the, the things look like, okay? So the, the black line is the expected variance, which is just, just the stochastic noise, okay? Poisson noise, this is just one over m bar for each each halo bean, okay? Must be. So it's, this is one over m bar, the black line. This is what happens if you use uh, Eulerian perturbation theory with a linear bias. You get much bigger noise. It's like six, seven times Poisson noise. 
So it's not good, okay? If you, if you use linear bias with a nonlinear density field on large scales, again, not very good. But if you use quadratic bias, then you get this orange line. So you go back to the, noise, to the Poisson noise, and this difference between the truth and the best fitted map becomes much less scale dependence. Okay? And why, why there is this big jump here? Well, this big jump here comes from the fact that when you include these second order fields, you take into account a significant part of these constant fluctuations, which do exist in the simulation box. So you see, on the level of the power spectrum, the, the contribution from the pure shot noise and the contribution from this thing is indistinguishable. They're both the same, just constant in K. But on the level of the field, on the level of the map, if you give me the initial conditions, I can calculate this contribution. It will be exactly like such and such Fourier mode with this phase and this amplitude. And I can find it out in the real simulation. And I can match the two. So the true noise, which is a real stochasticity, is much smaller than the naive noise or naive stochasticity uh, that people usually define as the, as the difference between p hello matter and b1 times p matter matter. So this is what people usually call stochasticity. But a significant part of that comes, is hidden in these perturbative formulas. In the level of the power spectrum, you don't see it, but in the full field, you do. Um, and it is also quite interesting that these things are flat, all the way to k of 1. Um, OK, so why these kind of exercises are important? Let me just say in a few, in few words. Um, well, because we do have, you see, we do have a map between initial conditions and final nonlinear field, and it's a simple perturbative map. And this allows us, in principle, to undo this perturbation theory, because perturbation theory is deterministic, plus some noise. So there is a way to undo the perturbation theory and go back to the initial conditions. And so therefore, this opens a way to um, basically do things like BO reconstruction, which is undoing these bulk flows that I was talking about yesterday. And people did a lot of work along these lines. You can do the full initial condition reconstruction. And this is what is called forward modeling, where you basically explore the likelihood for all possible phases and amplitudes of Fourier mode, or million dimension likelihood. And there are efficient ways to do that, basically using these maps. Rather than running simulations, doing complicated halo finder, which is not differentiable, and you have a problem in your like samplers and so on and so forth. If you use this simple formula, you may do better. I don't know if this is true or not, but uh, we, we, it's something that we're going to try and see what, what happens. And these kind of methods are very good for, for any kind of measurements of these bus parameters or comparisons between two different models, because you don't have cosmic variance, and you're comparing things Fourier mode by Fourier mode, not only summary statistics. It's a huge advantage. For example, in the power spectrum, you may have like 50 or 100 beans. But in simulations, you have 10 to the 8 Fourier modes. So 50 beans you can get right even with a sloppy model. But 10 to the 8 Fourier modes, all of them right, you're not going to get by chance. Okay, this is a very, very important point. But when you did the fit, you used all the same ah, Of course, absolutely. They all have to fit. I mean, this is the point. Um, otherwise, um, Batman. No, 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 we do it, we do it at one time. We fix one, one and a slice. Now, we are allowing B to be a function of K, only magnitude, not the direction. But it is flat up to K of 0.1 or 0.2. So this is really constant. So you can think of it as fitting into the constant up to where perturbation theory holds. So we have a few parameters and 10 to the 8 Fourier modes. And this is, and this is why it is so interesting, because it all works. It all makes sense. Yeah? Oh, time, time, just, just the time or the redshift, yes. Oh, yeah, the redshift. Oh, we were, we were doing this exactly at 0.6, 0.6. 0.6. Yeah. There was an excuse why to do 0.6. Uh, um, there will be no time for redshift for distortions. So, <laughs> so, so last week, there was no time for redshift for distortions, and this yes. week, there will be no time for <laughs> No, I, I, I promise I will say at least a few words about redshift for distortions. So, so what does it mean without cosmic variance is the following. So, so imagine that, so what happens in reality is that you have some um, distribution from which you draw the initial conditions. And let's call it X. 
Then you have some function f of x, which gives you an observable y, okay, which is our nonlinear field, which also has some distribution, or maybe it's non-Gaussian, I don't know. So when we, when we run n body simulation, for example, in the real universe, there is some random realization of x's, and we are measuring y's, okay? And so now we want to infer what is a typical x, for instance. Okay, and we measure the distribution of y, and we have to do cosmic variance because we don't know what was the exact realization in the initial condition. So therefore, there is some randomness. If you have a few measurements, you will have some uncertainty on that uh, what what x was. However, in simulations, we know exactly which x we drew from the initial conditions. So we do we do know what do we put in the initial conditions. And if you're interested in testing this function, because this is like Function can be a simulation or perturbation theory. If you're interested in testing only dynamics, only, only this mapping, then there is no reason to pay the price of randomness. Because I know exactly which x do I put in. Simulation takes this x and maps into exactly one y. I don't have a scatter. And then I can take another method, like perturbation theory, take the exact same x and see which y does it map to. Is it the same or is it not the same? But there is no cosmic variance price to be paid in this. In this thing. It's not a constraint. It's, it's, just like, it's just like a single realization. You just take a single realization. You don't constrain anything. Just draw random numbers. But if you take the same, for instance, like what does it mean? It means that if in the initial conditions there is an over density here and under density here, then when you evolve it with simulations, it will be something like that. But when you evolve with perturbation theory, it, it better be also something like that, because it comes from the same initial conditions. So in other words, it's not a random thing whether here you're going to go up or down. It must be the same. So, so, so the reason why we have cosmic variance is because in the real world, we have to average over all possible initial conditions. And then things get scattered. But in these exercises, when we do simulations, we know exactly what the initial conditions are. There is no reason for us to pay the price of cosmic variance. And it's very bad practice to run a big embodied simulation and then calculate the power spectrum by averaging, and then you introduce cosmic variance, and then you fit your curve. But why did you do that? You know exactly what the initial conditions are. You can pr make a prediction for the same initial conditions. There will be no cosmic variance whatsoever. It's a very important, important lesson. All right. That's very bad. We are, we, are, we, are, we are very late. Let me say just a few words about the final complication that goes into this discussion, which is the retrospace space distortions. So this complication actually is the most difficult one to deal with and probably the least explored um, in, in perturbation theory. Conceptually, there is nothing really difficult, but practically, then it becomes a bit more, more trickier than other things. OK, so, so dark matter works beautifully. Like real space, galaxies, halos, whatever, work beautifully. That all we understand. I mean, that's, that's fine. Now, the problem is that we don't really observe um, yeah, when we do observations, we're measuring redshifts. And so usually we make our maps by converting these redshifts into distances. And now the problem with this procedure is that if there were no peculiar velocities, that would be perfect. However, galaxies do have some peculiar velocities. So to <laughs> compare to their true position compared to us, because they have some extra velocity component along the line of sight, they will have some extra redshift. And so when we reconstruct the map, we're going to push them a bit further or a bit closer, depending on this extra redshift. And in that way, we are in introducing some distortions in our map. And these maps, these distortions are called redshift space distortions. Okay? So we are sitting here, observing in some direction. There is a galaxy here. If the Q velocity was zero, we could measure the redshift and measure the distance. But if there is some peculiar velocity v, then there is a component along the line of sight, which is v dot n. And this component gives some extra velocity. And then you have to take also into account the Hubble factor to turn it into some extra distance when you're 
estimating how far this is. Okay? And these kind of distortions produce this, like, like trouble because they take your original map with the density distribution and they, they turn into something uh, which is distorted, which has some preferential direction along the line of sight. So for instance, if you have a big, let's say, galaxy cluster and a lot of matter around it, there are other galaxies here, and for example, these galaxies typically are falling in because they feel an overdensity, and those inside are moving randomly because they're virialized in all possible directions. When, if you're observing from this side, for instance, the picture is going to be different from this one because those galaxies which are moving away from you, you're systematically going to push uh, further. Those that are coming towards you, you systematically push closer. And therefore, it will seem to you that there is some kind of an elliptical distribution rather than spherical in redshift space. On the other side, if you look at these random motions inside, those things that are along the line of sight will be moved much further, much closer in the random way. And you're going to get some elongated thing in the middle, OK? So the picture will be distorted compared to what originally looked like. Okay. Now, there are two parts of this distortion. So one has to do with, with these very uh, fast virial motions. And this effect is going to produce some kind of elongated structures, which are called fing fingers of God. And then um, this has to do with very small scale velocities. And then there is a contribution which comes from these uh, large scale velocities, which is this squashing of, of the maps. And this is perturbative. And this we can calculate. We can calc so far, we were always calculating densities. But there was also perturbation theory formula for velocities. And so therefore, I can calculate perturbatively what the velocities are. And therefore, I can take this effect into account on large scales. But these small scales are not under perturbative control. And they are causing the trouble. And the reason why there is such a big trouble with rest space is because what is localized in a finite region of space in real space becomes delocalized in, in rest space. So something which is a small regional space here becomes something which is very elongated thing in redshift space. So again, we have this mixing between small and large scales. And every time this happens, perturbation theory is in trouble. Okay? And so this is what is causing the most issues, uh, the proper treatment of this, of this effect. Okay? So how do we do the calculation? How, okay, this, this we cannot deal with in perturbation theory. There are ways to take a bit of that into account, but let me not talk about this. But in, in perturbation theory, what we have to do is to take this mapping between, so S usually is denoted as, as a redshift space position. So it's, a, it's like a real space coordinate, but in redshift space map. So for instance, some point here will have a position S, OK? So S is original position in space. And plus, you have to use the, the, the basically the, the Hubble law to convert extra velocity to distance. And the formula, in terms of peculiar velocities, is given in this way. So it's v dot n, because you have to look at the projection of the velocity along the line of sight. You have to divide by Hubble to get the distance. And you move the thing along direction n. Okay? So is this clear? It's a very simple thing. There's just some uh, extra piece when you do the conversion from redshift to distance because of the peculiar velocities. And then you may ask yourself, what, what, what we want to derive is what is the connection between delta S, the Fourier modes in this redshift space, and the Fourier modes in real space. Okay? And I don't have time to do this. I will just write down the final formula and explain how do you derive it. So this, this connection is, is something like that. So the, of course, there is, there is the Fourier mode in real space. And then plus, 
there will be the following thing. There will be, well, k dot n, um, let me say square divided by k squared, what else? I have f h, one over h, let me write it down in a way that at least I can explain where different pieces are coming from, and then delta of k. All right, so, so, so how do we get this? Well, the usual, the usual way to get this is to say that when I'm going from the real space distribution of matter in, to this retrospace space distribution of matter, I'm distorting everything, but the num number of objects is preserved. So therefore, one plus delta s uh, of s times d3 s must be equal to one plus delta x times d3x. So the total number of objects must be the same. So this is the condition when I do this squeezing of the map. And so if you plug back now here, for instance, if you just, let's, let's do the linear theory. If you, if you do the linear theory and plug back the expressions for the linear velocity, linear delta, uh, you go to Fourier space on both sides of this equation and so on and so forth, you can derive this formula. Okay, so this one over h comes from this one over h here. This f times h times delta is what is the velocity in the linear theory. Uh, if, you, if you look at the continuity equation, you just take the linear theory, this is what it's going to be. So this is your velocity. And then um, when you go to, to, to delta, because but basically when you, when, you, when you go do the Fourier transform, there will be this k multiplying s in the exponent. When you expand it, you will have like k dot n here, and there is one k dot n here from the Fourier modes of velocity k. So basically, you get an expression like this. You can find this in any textbook on cosmology. So this is a very basic derivation. It's just linear theory, nothing more than that. Oh, you remember, sorry, you remember that f I wrote it at some point, it's d ln d over d ln a. It is the logarithmic growth function. And you remember I told you that in the lambda, in lambda CDM, when we do this, you remember we were doing this approximation in einstein sitter when we do perturbation theory. Everything was proportional to the a scale factor. However, in the more complicated cases, there were these factors of f times h times theta. This was our new theta tilde variable and so on. So this f was this logarithmic growth factor. And it comes out naturally when you do the continuity equation. Do you remember that? Did you do this last week? What is the f and so on? You all did? Yes, so then, 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 then this is what it is. It does that, yeah. Okay, so now, um, so usually, uh, like, like we define, so if this is our line of sight n, and this is some Fourier mode k, there's some angle theta, and we define cosine theta to be mu, and, and, and then we can rewrite this formula saying that delta s, so in, in, in Fourier space, the, um, um, the, 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 the mode k is given by delta k plus here we're going to have things like, sorry, there will be mu squared when I simplify this expression, and then there will be f and then there will be another delta, because h cancels, there will be another delta, okay? Or, even simpler, one plus f mu squared delta of k. So this is in linear theory. And so you see that there is some distortion of the Fourier modes depending on the, on, the, on, the, on the position of the Fourier mode with respect to the line, line of sight, okay? So if you're looking perpendicular to the line of sight, this distortion goes away. Because if you, if, 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 if you have modes perpendicular to the line of sight or velocities, you remember this k vector also comes from the velocity here, it's the same k vector. So if you're looking at things perpendicular to the line of sight, there is no retrospace distortions. They go away because um, nothing is moving towards you or far away from you. And if you look at, at, at modes which go parallel to the line of sight, the effect is the biggest one, okay? 
Now, this formula is a very well-known Kaiser formula. And the power spectrum in redshift space, so PS of K, when you calculate the power spectrum of this quantity, just becomes 1 plus F mu squared, all squared times P linear of K. And this is the Kaiser power spectrum, a very simple thing. It, it just tells you that if you have a linear power spectrum in real space, then when you go to redshift space, there will be some distortion which depends on this angle in this particular way. Okay? And this is a linear leading order in perturbation theory. Now, to go beyond this leading order in perturbation theory, all that you have to do is to go back to this formula, go back to Fourier space, blah, 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 blah. There will be some, when you, for example, when you go to Fourier space for this quantity, there is a factor e to the i k s. Okay? And when you replace s by this thing to make, to match the two sides, then you get e to the i k x times e to the i k dot this whole thing. So there is k dot n and then v dot n over h. So, so to get to this formula, what we did is to expand this exponent and keep only the leading term. But if you want to go beyond per leading term perturbation theory, just keep all other terms in this exponent, OK? So that's all that it is. So taking, again, taking the, taking the um, relation space distortions into account in the nonlinear perturbation theory is as simple as just starting from this formula, expanding everything to whatever order in perturbation theory you want, and putting properly all the pieces together. Okay? Now, there is one subtlety when you do this that I want to mention. Uh, and this is a subtlety that we saw before. But let me just repeat. So the subtlety is that if you if you do this, maybe I should let me write down a few terms only. So delta s of k is delta of k plus there is i k dot n over h and then b dot n. This was the first term that we, that we had there. And then there will be other terms which come from this expansion, okay? So higher order terms. And so how do they look like? So there are many up to cubic order, but let me write down just one of them, for instance. There is i square over 2. Um, there is k dot n over h squared, and then times v dot n squared, OK? And now this is, these are simple functions. But here, I'm squaring the velocity field and calculating Fourier component k, and so on. So what do, I, what do I get in this expression is that if I go to higher orders, there will be many multiplications of the velocity. And if you open up this formula, there will be also d squared times delta and so on. So all these terms are appearing in the connection between the redshift space Fourier modes and the real space Fourier modes. And all of these terms can be calculated. They don't come with the free coefficients. However, these kind of objects where you're multiplying two fields in the same point are, again, like, for example, delta squared in the bias expansion. They may require a counter term. So uh, it's not enough just to expand this and pretend that everything is OK. These are like so-called composite operators. You're multiplying something in the same point in space. You may require a counter term. In the same way as in the bias expansion, if you have multiplications of different fields in the same point, you may require a counter term. And so compared to the standard like um, dark matter case or bias tracers case, there are a few extra counter terms which depend on mu to take into account this these kind of effects in redshift space. But they're very simple, and you can find them in the literature if, you, if you're interested. But you know, conceptually, again, there is nothing problematic here. You just take this map, you expand it in perturbation theory, you just make sure that you put all the proper counter terms to absorb all the UV dependence. Again, the same story as with the bias and dark matter, and that's it. You have an expression which you can then use to, for example, go and, and, and measure, for example, the anisotropic power spectrum. 
which now depends on k and mu. And as a final comment, as I promised, let me say this. So this is what happens in higher orders, and let's leave it there. But coming back to this simple linear formula, let me expand it. So for instance, uh, so the linear retrospective distortions are going to be something like that. There will be B1 square times P linear. There will be plus two times F mu square times P linear. And there will be, oh, sorry, what am I talking about? So first of all, let me, let me say that if you do galaxies, the only thing that changes is that here you have to put delta galaxy. Sorry, that, that, let me forget about this. Let me, let me say that. This, all, all this that I said so far is a dark matter. But if I want to do galaxies, then the whole procedure goes on. I will just replace here this delta with delta G. So I have to say that the number of galaxies is preserved when I do this mapping and so on and so forth. However, importantly, this mapping always remains the same. This doesn't matter on that whether you have a galaxy or dark matter particle. So, so how much you're closer or further is just an issue of using the Hubble law to determine the distance. So therefore, if I want to do bias tracers, if I want to do bias tracers, this formula becomes this. So there is delta S of K is going to be delta galaxy of K. But the second part, um, mu square F, comes again with delta, sorry, it, it comes only with, uh, it comes only with delta matter, because this delta here, so this is very important, so it comes delta of K, there is no, no delta of G. So this delta of K comes from the fact that there was a relation between velocity and underlying matter, not underlying galaxy fields. So you see? No, nobody's following anymore. So, so, so there is a velocity here without any basis function. This velocity depends on the total matter distribution. It is like how the whole thing moves, okay? It is not a biased velocity. It is a velocity of both dark matter particles and halo particles. And if I want to make a connection between this velocity and delta, I can just use continuity equation. And so therefore, um, this piece of the equation cares only about delta matter, not about delta galaxy. So which means that if I do the power spectrum um, of, for example, galaxies in Rescue space, uh, it is going to be something like that. There will be B1 plus F times mu squared, all squared times P linear. Okay. And this is because I'm taking the galaxy density field and I'm moving things around according to the velocity, which de depends on delta matter, not on delta galaxy. And now, this is very interesting because if I expand this formula, I will have terms which are B1 squared times P linear. And again, this one scales like B1 squared times sigma eight squared. But there will be also a term which goes like this. There will be mu squared, uh, so F mu squared, and then B1 times P linear, which scales like B1 times sigma eight times F mu square sigma eight, well, let me write it like that, F sigma eight, times mu squared, times, yeah, this is what it is. So do you see what, so this one is obvious because there are two fields here, so it's sigma eight squared. Now here, I have only B1, and I have two sigma eights from this P linear again. So I combine them like B1 times sigma eight, and then another sigma eight goes like F times sigma eight, and then there is some mu square which is left over. So now, again, if you look at this power spectrum and you look only at the part of it which does not depend on mu, so you do this measurement, you basically, in a sense, average over mu, and you look only at the mu independent part, this one measures this combination, B1 times sigma eight, okay? But if you look at the mu squared term in this power spectrum, that one measures 
another combination because this one is fixed by the first term, and then you can get F sigma 8 from the second one. And this quantity is very important. You will see it all over the place um, in, for example, galaxy clustering. Yeah? People always talk about this quantity F sigma 8. It is something that we can measure from the redshift space power spectrum. And the reason why we can measure it is because we break this degeneracy in this way. We start with something which uh, has both pieces inside, and we can use term which is not proportional to um, mu squared to get the usual combination, B1 times sigma 8. And the second term measures the other thing, which is F sigma 8. And this is how we get cosmology from redshift space distortions without having to worry about the bias. Now, this is again at the linear level, and you can do everything in the full glory, the nonlinear level, with IRS summation, bias tracers, the space. This becomes complicated, but there is nothing uh, more to be added. By the way, let me also say one thing. A more formal way, of course, to isolate these pieces, which, are, uh, which don't depend on mu, or they depend on mu square, and so on, is to start with this function, which is a general, generic function of k and mu, and do multiple expansion. So what you can define always is PL of k, which is the, by definition 2L plus 1 over 2 integral from minus 1 to 1, d mu, your power spectrum, P of k mu, and then Legendre polynomial PL of mu. And this is what people really measure in, in, like in the data. So for, instance, for example, if you put L equals 0, then P of zero is constant, and you're just averaging over mu, and you're going to get this first term. If you put L equals two, you're going to get the, the quadruple, and this is going to pick up this contribution, and so on and so forth. So when people talk about monopole, quadruple, in the galaxy clustering, this is what they mean. They would measure the full anisotropic power spectrum, they average over different Legendre polynomials, and they isolate these different pieces. And sometimes people say, we measure B1 times F sigma 8 from the monopole, and we measure sigma 8, F sigma 8 from the quadrupole, and this is what it means. It means that if you go to the monopole, you measure this combination. If you go to the quadrupole, you break the generous and you get this guy. All right, and so um, let me finish by showing again how does this work in practice. So I showed this the very first day, and maybe back then you were thinking, I don't even know what this is. But now, like after all week of uh, formula, 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 this is, this, now you understand a bit better maybe what I'm, I was talking about. So what is shown here again is like some super large volume simulations. They have very tiny error bars, um, far, far sub-percent error bar measurements of L equals zero and L equals two. Now, of course, this L equals zero, the black solid line, is exactly the power spectrum a monopole, L equals two, this blue line is the power spectrum quadrupole. So these are simulations which contain galaxies, satellites, all of these complications, and the curves are perturbation theory predictions. One loop perturbation theory predictions, including bias tracers, redshift space distortions, iris summation, and, and everything else. And, and you can see that, that, that even with these ridiculously small error bars, um, we can fit this uh, simulations pretty well. So we get a joint fit of the monopole and quadrupole, for instance, and uh, everything looks uh, very, very good. Okay? So with these kind of error bars, you can get sub-percent measurements of all cosmological parameters without any priors. You just, somebody just gives you the simulation box, you run your MCMC with these formulas, and you measure sigma 8, for example, to 0.5%, Hubble is 0.5%, like, I don't know, B1 is 0.7% and so on. You can break all the degeneracies. So the fact that you have to introduce so many bias parameters, counters, and so on, doesn't hurt so much because um, in some sense, these things are really there and it's better to put them in. It improves your fit and makes sure that you're not biased and makes everything work. If you remove these things, then the whole thing will fall apart. And so this is, this is the thing that I'm going to uh, finish with. So at two, I'm going to talk about application of all these formulas to the real data, 
of the BOSS survey. It is a similar analysis, just to see how that look like, look, looks like applied to the real survey. But um, I really want to say that, of course, a lot of activity in cosmology is in more practical things, and there is a lot of work to be done with, with all these uh, new telescopes and putting all things together and making sure that everything works. But I wanted to, in, in, in this week, I wanted also to give you some flavor about what is happening on the other side of the story, where you really have to come up with some formula. What are you going to compare your data to? And um, I, I think that, um, I don't know if I succeeded, but we, we are not completely helpless. We, it's not that we have no clue what to do. I mean, we do have some good understanding of what is happening. We do have some decent idea about how to calculate things. And even for very complicated objects, such as respiratory distortions or galaxies, we are not completely lost, OK? So there is some value in um, understanding all these details. So even if you're not doing theory, or you're not going to use this calculation for your, yourself, it is good to keep in back on your mind that there is some logic behind it. It's not a completely made up story. I mean, there is some formalism. There is some um, estimate of the errors. There is some uh, understanding of what are the most dominant physical processes, and so on and so forth. And it works. It, in practice, it really works. OK, thanks. This is You know, I never fully understood why you never multiply by a theory. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, so, so it's just because these velocities are not are nothing to do with, with bias. Yes. You never see this written, you know? Is that true? Very well, I guess. I never, <laughs> never saw. Okay, uh -huh. questions? Marco, when you go beyond linear theory, why shouldn't you also take into account a transverse Doppler effect in that expansion. Sorry, the? The transverse Doppler effect, because you went into uh, linear theory there. Yes. And you assumed gamma to be, gamma, the Lorentz factor to be one, right? Oh. Why oh, shouldn't right, you take right. it into account there? Um, well, because as, as I said the first day, like we're always working in the limits where all these velocities are small. Uh, because you see, this, this expansion is not expansion in perturbation theory. It's expansion in V over C, because what enters the, the gamma factor will be V over C. So it's true that if you expand V over C, we have higher order terms, but uh, they're suppressed by, by, by the speed of light. So then they're not important. When you go to large angular scales, there are another correction, kind of correction which are super important, which are relativistic corrections. But then there, the parameter is different. It's about K over H, or H over K. So, so there are two kind of relativistic things that you have to keep in mind. One is when your Fourier mode becomes so long that it's of the size of the horizon, and then you cannot use Newtonian picture anymore. And those also can be calculated, taken into account. And these are relativistic corrections on large scales. And then there is another kind of corrections, which what you're talking about, some maybe motions, even without GR, there's some V over C and so on. And both of them are, I, I suppress, and for the purposes of staying on relatively not super large scales and dealing with the usual velocities in the clusters of galaxies and so on. This is perfectly fine. Uh, I have a question. How can we get the dipole contribution? Just by simulations or, for instance, because we, we go from the monopole to the quadrupole? But yes. Well, there is no dipole. I think in theory, there is no dipole because you, can, you cannot have like a preferred direction uh, mm -hmm. in your simulation box. You, by symmetries, you always have a quadrupole. There is no dipole contribution. Because dipole would mean that there is some no motion of everybody towards the, mm -hmm. some particular point. But this is not what, what it is. Yeah. So, so, so if you average, if everything is OK with periodic boundary conditions, eh, then there is no dipole. I mean, in reality, I think that people even see a bit of a dipole, or they may see a bit of a dipole for various reasons. And one way that they, people even test their systematics is to see if there is some residual dipole in the, in the correlation function. But, uh, but in principle, as long as you stay in the, in the theory world, there is no dipole, unless you do something very bad. More questions for Marco? I don't see hands. So, um, I think we were, we, we were very privileged to have this set of lectures by Marco. It 
we, was fantastic. So let's thank Marco again. <laughs> We see all this coming to practice at 2, 2 p.m. <laughs>